Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 and 18 tonight. But I also want you to find Isaiah chapter 58 in your Old Testament. Put your finger there or somebody's finger there or a bookmark of some kind. And we're going to read that part of that chapter here in just a, a little bit. So, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. I was going to just kind of skip over this. It's the two verses, three verses about fasting from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but I decided I wouldn't. I decided to go ahead and give us a little background. And maybe the next time it comes up in your Sunday school lesson, you'll have a little more background information to help you better understand parts of what they were saying. So I'm reading tonight from the New International Version, the Revised Standard Version, I'm sorry, the Revised Standard Version, Matthew 6, 16. Jesus, Jesus is talking. He says, uh, did you get us on here, Brother Mike? Are we uh, All right, we're on. Greetings to our Facebook crowd. I just realized that <laughs> we have to say hello to those on our Facebook page, and especially, it, and also, on, Tom is reminding me, also on our new big camera back right there that's got the light on showing me it's recording. That will be for our YouTube channel after Tom uploads that after tonight's service. But welcome to Facebook. We hope and pray that tonight you can see it without interruption since it's not Sunday morning and since hopefully there's enough bandwidth that we won't, uh, it won't sit there and spool on us tonight. Welcome, welcome. Matthew 6, verse 16, Revised Standard Version. Jesus said, And when you fast... Do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. So what is their reward? And the attention and the praise of men. And the insinuation in Jesus' words, the insinuation is that that's all the reward they're going to get. <laughs> they won't get any more reward. That's it. You got it. Uh, I hope all of you as church members, when you read something like this and understand what we're talking about right here, it, I, know it, I know that all of you at Union Baptist Church, this is not a problem here. But Sunday Bud, I've been in churches where, you know, uh, somebody in the choir has got to do the solo, and if they don't get to do it, to get their feelings hurt, move the membership, all that kind of stuff. Mike, you know, you've been at churches like that. Thank God we don't have that here. But it helps us to, to keep our pride level down because we want the, appraise, we want the applause of God. We don't need the applause of men. We need God to approve what we do, not somebody else. So they have their reward. Verse 17, but when you fast, I should have underlined you because Jesus is putting an emphasis there on his disciples. When you fast, remember, this is his disciples. Remember, he's sitting up on the mountainside. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching. It's his disciples that have gathered around him. Remember that, okay? So he's saying to his disciples, and by extension to all of his disciples, then and today now, Jesus says, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. We'll talk about the oil in just a minute on further down on the page. <clears throat> in Jesus' day when he lived and when he had his ministry, there was only one mandatory fast, obligatory fast, obligatory fast uh, for the nation of Israel, for the Jews. Only one, and that was the Day of Atonement. It was an obligation every Jew. And in Jesus' day, they were obligated to maintain the fast on the Day of Atonement. Now, I taught one night on the Day of Atonement, 
where we took the scapegoat and went out into the woods. I hope some of y'all remember that, how the high priest, all of Israel came and everybody brought their goat, to be, I mean, sheep to be sacrificed. And it was a day when everybody's supposed to confess all their sins. And the high priest came out there and he symbolically raised his hands over the crowd and symbolically he was receiving all of the confessed sins of the people for the entire past year. And then he turned and symbolically placed his head, he, he literally put his hands on that goat, the scapegoat, Haziel, the scapegoat. He put his hands there to symbolically transfer the sins of Israel to this goat. And then an appointed priest was there to take that goat into the wilderness so far away from Israel that the goat could never find its way back. This was God's way of teaching them symbolically that God was removing their sins and they would not be seen again. And then they went in and did the sacrifice of the lambs and all that good stuff. So I talked to you about that. So I hope you remember some of that teaching. So that's the one fast, the one day of the year that Israel, all everybody in Israel was required to fast. The fast started uh, at dawn and it ended at sundown. <clears throat> the fast started, uh, back to some of those strict laws that the Jews made, when you could distinguish between a black thread and a white thread that you held up. And when you could finally tell which one was white and which one was black, the fast started right then. That was the official starting time. And then when sundown, at sundown, the fast ended. So that was the Jewish law. Now, that law stated... On, I'm quoting, on the Day of Atonement, it is forbidden to eat or to drink or to bathe or to anoint oneself. Notice that word, anoint. To anoint oneself or wear sandals. Why do you think it was prohibited to wear sandals? Ah, oh, thank you, Ann. So they could feel the pain of walking on the rock. So they could step on the thorns of any. They would feel the pain. And hopefully they would remember that God had provided coverings for their feet. Very sim a lot of symbolism going on here. So they, they, were, they couldn't wear sandals. <clears throat> they could not indulge in conjugal intercourse. They could not have the marital relations with their husbands and wives. They had to abstain. Nurses and pregnant women were exempt. And if you were a soldier and you was on a march somewhere, you were exempt from this fast. But when you got through with the march, you got back to where you were supposed to be, you had to set aside another day, at that period from dawn to sunset, when you observed the fast. Because everybody had to observe the fast. Okay, so even though there was only one mandatory day for fasting, the Jewish people of Jesus' day did a lot of other private fasting. For example, when someone died, they fasted from the time the person died until the graveside service or until the person was buried. They fasted. <clears throat> uh, when an individual or a nation wanted forgiveness of sin, how many times in the Old Testament in all your many years of Sunday school lessons, how many times did the prophets of God call the whole nation of Israel to a national fast because they had sinned and God was punishing them or God was threatening to punish them and the prophets would call the whole nation to come out and repent in sackcloth and ashes and have a fast, a national fast. So that was another time when fasting occurred or when an individual who wasn't just a pious individual but genuinely wanted God to know that they had sinned and they had wanted forgiveness for that sin. They fasted as a means to get God's attention and to say to God, I'm really, really serious here, God. I'm not just doing this for a show. I want you to forgive my sins. I'm really, really genuinely penitent, and, and I want forgiveness. I'm repentant. I want forgiveness. 
Some people fasted in preparation for a revelation from God himself. Moses is the best example because when he went up on the mountain, he fasted. Um, he was up there 40 days and 40 nights, but he got the Ten Commandments. He was waiting on that revelation from God. Uh, the Jews attach these three ideas I've got printed on your sheet to the practice of fasting. First, it was a deliberate means to draw the attention of God to the person who fasted. That was, uh, that was the beginning in the Bible. Fasting sort of evolved like prayer evolved and other things evolved in the biblical record. And, and so, but it was a means to draw God's attention uh, to that person who was in fact fasting. Uh, the second thing was it was a deliberate means to proclaim that the person who was fasting was genuinely repentant and desired forgiveness of some sin. And then thirdly, fasting for the Jewish nation was vicarious. Now, by vicarious, this is what I mean. There were always a group of people, primarily ladies, uh, ladies like y'all do here, when y'all come aside and pray and and, and, and pray for our church and for all of us when y'all do that. Uh, th there was always a group of people in the nation of Israel who would fast asking God's forgiveness of the nation's sins and asking God's blessings on the nation. And they did that because the, the whole nation couldn't come to a screeching halt and everybody fast all the time. And so there was always this group of people who fasted before God on behalf of the nation itself. It's pretty impressive, is it not? So they were fasting vicariously. How long did the fasting last? From the time in the morning when you could distinguish enough light. They, but they were strong in 40 days. So how did they distinguish how long did they fast? Most of the fasting that we're talking about here was for that period of time between dawn and sunset. Now there were other periods of prolonged fasting like Anne's referring to uh, where people would fast for a specific cause or a specific reason. Remember Jesus himself fasted in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, you remember? And so uh, that, that fasting was a, was a pronounced thing. <clears throat> and so then, the, the, but the normal days during the week when people would normally fast uh, would be, good evening, Doug. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Thank you for God's safety for you coming down that highway tonight. Normally the Jews fasted on Monday and Thursday. Twice a week the Jews fasted on Monday and Thursday. It just so happened that Monday and Thursday were also market days. That's when all the folks from the surrounding countryside would come into Jerusalem or into the big town that they lived the closest to and buy their supplies. And so Mondays and Thursdays were market days. Therefore, there would be a whole bunch of folks in the city, in the marketplace, and those hypocritical Jews that Jesus condemned here, uh, those Jews... Uh, they would find the most populous intersection, the busiest intersection, closest to the marketplace, so that they could be seen by the most people. And they would muss up their hair, and they would have big old long faces, and, and they would, you know, if, any, if anybody couldn't guess, they'd tell everybody, well, don't bother me, it's my fast day, I'm fasting today. And they were doing that to be noticed of men. They were doing that to, to stick their thumbs in their armpits and say, look at me, I'm so good, I'm so pious, I'm so religious or whatever. Those are the people that Jesus condemned. So that when Jesus then said to his disciples, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. The old King James says, anoint your heads. That's why I referred to that word anoint earlier, because that word anoint was used 
symbolically in a lot of other places, it, it was used as an act of um, uh, not not of fasting, but it was a it was a symbol of joy, of delight, of celebration. And so here's what Jesus is saying to his disciples: You camouflage what you're doing so that you won't ever be tempted to think you're so much better than anybody else because you're fasting. Now, the other folks, the scribes and Pharisees, they're going to make fun of you because Monday and Thursday is a fast day, and they know you're supposed to be fasting. You're my disciple. They're going to accuse you of not fasting because you anoint your head. And they're going to say, what is all this about? They, they don't even fast, you know, and more criticism for Jesus and his disciples. I couldn't really find a place where he and his disciples went aside to fast. So if they did, the gospel writers didn't record it. Uh, and so his disciples coming out anointing with anointed heads and all big smiles on their face and instead of crunching up their face and trying to impress everybody that they were fasting, they came out joyous, celebratory. I thought another reason for that might be because later on Jesus is going to go into all those parables and he's going to talk about the bridegroom and they're with the bridegroom now and so they should be joyous you know they should be celebratory um, I don't know I'm just kind of thinking outside the box right there but that's where I'm thinking okay <clears throat> so uh, they were very conspicuous because they seldom if ever fasted publicly now Note on your page that modern science has proclaimed many good reasons for people to fast. It's good for your overall health. It's a great method for learning self-discipline. It's a method to teach us how to break. That should be break, not break the bread. I got a typo. Y'all need to correct that. To break addictions like fasting from coffee or alcohol. Oops, that, we're in a Baptist church. I didn't need to put that one. Fasting from sweets or breads or anything like that. <clears throat> fasting also teaches a person that they can, in fact, do without certain things. Now, the next time y'all see my wife, y'all ask her, uh, did you get a Starbucks today? <laughs> All right. Fasting can teach us that we really can do without some of those perks in life that we have become so accustomed to and that we take for granted every single day. So if we were to actually practice fasting, that's one reason that, that it's good. <clears throat> we can also fast from other certain luxuries so that we can actually appreciate them all the more. Now, fasting has kind of in the churches I don't know of a lot of Christian people today who practice fasting when I was saved 1980 that's a long time ago and I was reading through the Bible and I came to this Sermon on the Mount passage and I saw where Jesus said when you fast and it dawned on me that he did not say if you fast and so I sort of took that as a brand new Christian like a commandment that I'm supposed to fast and so I asked some of my senior Christian folks at Bethany Baptist Church and some of them gave me some books on fasting and I studied what I could about it and I decided I was going to practice it and so I did I admit today that it was probably for all the wrong reasons. I really thought that I had to do that. And then that becomes legalistic if you have to do something. Uh, and I learned several years later that I didn't have to be legalistic. I'm not boasting about this today. Please don't hear me doing that. But I did learn to fast, and it was a good discipline for me. Uh, I got up to three days. I couldn't go past three days. I don't know how anybody went 40 days. Um, but somewhere along the way, the Holy Spirit convic convinced me that I didn't have to do that to prove anything to anybody. If I wanted God's attention, all I had to do was say, Father, and I got his attention. 
I didn't even have to do like that old missionary did. Oh, I can't remember his name. Dropped on his knees every morning by his bed and said, Good morning, God. This is, I can't remember his name, Smith. And he paused effectively and said, David Smith. As if God didn't know which Smith he was talking to. I thought that was very humorous. But the man had good intentions. So I knew that I didn't have to call attention to myself by fasting. Uh, now today, modern science says it's good for you. And there are many, the fad diets that's going around now is you fast for a certain period of hours and then you eat. And eat anything you want to and then you fast for a certain period of hours. And I've talked to folks who tell me they've lost pounds and pounds of weight by doing this fasting diet. All of us fast most of the time. We fast when we go to bed at night. And we break that fast with break break fast in the morning <laughs> so we do but at any rate enough about that kind of fasting I want us to turn to Isaiah 58 Isaiah 58 now I'm back to my new international version Isaiah 58 verse 1 Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Here is God speaking to his prophet with those instructions. Shout aloud. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion. Declare to the house of Jacob their sins for Verse 2, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Verse 3, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Here's the nation of Israel questioning God. They're, they're complaining to God. Look at him, God. We've been fasting all this time. I mean, we, you know, look, look, we're, you, we're fasting, and, and you hadn't even paid any attention to us. How come you hadn't heard us? How, how come you hadn't come near to us? Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed. Yet on the day of your fasting, now God's replying through the prophet, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Stop there for just a minute. As we read through this, I want you uh, <clears throat> in your mind to be making a comparison between Israel that Isaiah is talking to and about and America today. Make that comparison if you would. So lots and lots and lots of folks in America who say that they're Christian folks and I'm not the judge. I don't know who's Christian, who's not. But lots and lots and folks, lots and lots of folks are saying that God is going to destroy America. And then they cite reasons why God's going to destroy America. Uh, abortion was one, but now Roe versus Wade is overturned. Uh, maybe God will not destroy America since that's been overturned. I'm being quite facetious. Forgive me. I'll get to it in just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> but the prophet here is talking about a nation that they seem to come and do all the right things in this fasting business. Compare the fasting to worship in America, any worship in America, any denomination, any church, anywhere. Christian people, Christian people go to church often, and, and they, they say, look at us, God. 
we're doing so good here, aren't we? Aren't we doing good? Uh, we must be doing good. You've blessed us with a $10 million family life building or whatever it is. Uh, we must be doing good. And, and we're praying for America, God, that you won't destroy America because we are doing what's right. Politicians. I've been pretty stern with y'all in this past year not to bring politics into the church, and I'm not doing that tonight. I'm just using the word politicians to, to show you how politicians will say whatever you want to hear to get your vote, and it has absolutely nothing to do with their Christianity or their lifestyle. Uh, but they want your vote. They, they, uh, they are demagogues every single one of those. And you know the word demagogue, right? The most famous, the most famous example of this word was by our, our own beloved former governor, George Wallace. When one of the news media, when Wallace was running for president at that time, we all remember that, uh, one of the news media accused George Wallace of being a demagogue. And George Wallace got up in arms. He got mad, he got angry. And he shouted, I ain't no demagogue. <laughs> I just tell people what they want to hear. <laughs> Which is the exact definition of a demagogue. He tells people what they want to hear. He doesn't tell them the truth. Uh, and George didn't even know that he'd done that to himself at that moment. Anyway, uh, I, I, I bring this to your attention because uh, in America, as much as I love America, and I've already stated to you uh, all my... Uh, nationalism. I mean, I, I point out to you every time that I volunteered to serve my country, and I did in the United States Army. Uh, I spent 31 months in Germany. I love my country, so I'm, I'm a patriot in the true sense of the word. But I'm not going to stand in any church or outside of church or anywhere else and profess things that's not good. Just can't do that. So in America, we have all of our issues and all of our problems, and that's why I keep trying to get you to focus on the kingdom of God rather than politics. Focus on what is just and what is right rather than on politics. So let's go ahead now and read down into this. God has said to them now, you don't expect me to hear you. You don't expect your voice to be heard in heaven. You act in the way you're acting. So let's see what he's talking about here. He's already said you do as you please and exploit all your workers. <clears throat> so now God gets a little sarcastic with them. In verse, verse 5, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Only one day? Is one day of fasting going to take care of all the ills of the nation of Israel? He's being quite sarcastic. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? So you come out here and you bow your head and you lay out your pallet of sackcloth and you pour ashes all over it and you lay down and you act like you're in subjection to me. You act like you're humbling yourself to me. Uh, is that what I ask? Is that, is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice? Is there injustice in America? Is there injustice in the world? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Verse 7, Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked? to clothe him 
and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. So this is the fast that God demands, and I'm very happy to know that this church and many other churches do many of these very good things. Every third Saturday, some of y'all come up here and hand out food boxes to those people who need them. Our sister church, First Baptist Grand Bay, has got a humongous clothes closet for anyone who needs clothes and can't afford them. We take up offerings all the time to feed the hungry. We have a world hunger offering, Southern Baptist Convention, every year. I'm sure this church contributes to that. We support a lot of poor people in the work that we do as Baptists. I am delighted that to be a part of church people who actually try to do some of these things. So I want to pat you on the back for doing all the good things that we do. And I want to encourage us to keep on doing the good things and to do even more good things when we can. And I want us to pray for our nation because I think in our nation there are a lot of the same injustices going on that were going on in the state of Israel that day. I read a lot of commentaries on this chapter um, the inference up here in that first part where Isaiah said that they, um, they exploit all their workers. <clears throat> uh, the commentaries say that there's historical evidence in the writings, in the ancient writings, that this day of fasting that they were doing was only for those with enough monetary means that they didn't have to go to work that day. But they wouldn't let all of their day laborers not go to work and attend the fast because they would be losing too much money. And they were, in, in the words of some of the commentators, they were more concerned about their business being profitable than they were about God hearing them in the fast that they were trying to do. So that's, that's profound, isn't it? Um, anyway, for whatever that's worth. Oh, God then makes a lot of good promises to them if they will do these things that he's asking them to do, that he will restore the nation, that he will bless the nation greatly. One of the things that I've learned as I have studied the Old Testament prophets, that every time God pronounces this judgment, he never ever does that without coming back and saying, and yet I will restore you. And yet, if you do what I'm asking you to do, repent, turn from your wicked ways, I will restore you. He always promises, and he does. He lavished lots of good stuff on the nation of Israel. Ah, well, I think that's about all I need to do with that tonight. Let me stop and see what you have to say. I put questions on the back side of the page. Um, if you were went over the Isaiah passage, my mind went back to the 90s and early 2000s in Southern Baptist world changes. And the kids paid their own way and they worked. And people would often come up to us on those trips and would say, well, how much are you get paid to do this? We said, nothing. I, our kids paid. That's right. And, and I, that was a kind of fast for those kids because they mm -hmm. made a sacrifice mm -hmm. to go and serve someone else. And I'm afraid we now lost a generation because we did away with war change. We did away with that type of mission work. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, I, th I thought back to those kids that, that made the sacrifice to go to serve somebody else and the impact it had on folks that they met. That's right. That, that they were just there to serve them. That's a very good comment, Mike. Uh, let me make it very personal. <clears throat> when I was at St. Elmo First Baptist Church, we, we went to Centrifuge and World Changers every year. I always took a group of kids. At First Baptist St. Elmo, I took <clears throat> Rusty Roberts and his brother, Barry Roberts, and I took the Massingill kids 
some of them you all know. And we took a lot of kids every year. One year we went over to one of the suburbs of, I believe it was Atlanta, I don't remember. Anyway, we went to this uh, very poor black neighborhood and we, the, the people who set this up in the Southern Baptist Convention, they go way early and they pick out, they, they, they survey, they ask, uh, you know, the churches ask people, they, they find a house that need work. Well, they found this house of a black widow woman uh, whose roof was leaking terribly and she didn't have the means to repair it. She was on social security. Uh, she had children who were sorry as a day is long. She was raising grandkids like a lot of that generation and this generation still does. Anyway, she was just delighted for us to come over there. And during those days, we could actually put the roof on. You can't do that anymore. They won't let you roof anymore because of insurance. Uh, but we actually put a roof on that house. Uh, and so this black lady and her children, some of her children came, but she was absolutely fascinated by what Mike just said, that we came all the way from uh, Alabama we came all the way from Alabama to put a roof on her house, and yet her membership was in a local Baptist church less than a mile from her home. It was a black church, uh, but that church did nothing to help her put a roof on her house. And she was amazed that us white folk would come from Alabama and freely put a roof on her house. It strengthened her faith and belief in God's children greatly. And I don't mean to say that to condemn the church close to her, uh, but I find that, I found it everywhere, I still find it here. Still find it here. I uh, won't call any names or any church names. At Volunteers of America, we, the first 20 years I was there, uh, Paul McClendon and I and George and some other, a whole bunch of other folks, we. We get out here and we, you know, we got grants and we, we got a lot of good stuff. We got donations from churches. We go to churches like this and tell them what we're going to do and they'd give us food and money to buy food for it anyway. Oh, and then we would distribute that in some, we had some churches in some very poor neighborhoods that we would distribute all that stuff to and just try to help folks out. Well, one of those churches um, I think has done really well. And that pastor has stayed in touch with me over the years. He calls me periodically because we still have uh, donations come to VOA, wheelchairs, walkers, canes, you know, all the normal stuff. And so that pastor calls me from time to time, uh, Brother Digger, what kind of goodies you got up there? <laughs> and he called me. This is how God works. This is a God thing. Tell you a quick story. So somebody came to us and wanted to donate one of those motorized wheelchairs. Their, their loved one had used it, and it was in good working order, but their loved one had died, and they wanted us to find a home where people didn't have insurance, didn't have the money, and needed one of those scooters. And so I unloaded that heavy thing, and put it back there in the room. Now, I asked, I called, made some calls, asked a lot of people, no, no, brother, we, we're good right now. We don't need anything or anything. And about 10 days later, my friend called me. Hey, brother Digger, what's going on at VOA? Bingo, the light goes off in my head. I said, well, what do you need? He said, well, I'm calling you today because I want to know if you got a spare wheelchair. He said, I got a lady in my church, a widow lady that had to have her leg amputated below the knee. She's got sugar real bad. And so they got that part off and she said, I can handle this, I can do that. I can use a little wheelchair, I can roll myself around, I can use crutches, there ain't no problem, let's go. And she said, then they got her in the hospital and decided they had to take the other one off. And she was devastated, she didn't know what she was gonna do. So he was calling me to know if we had a wheelchair that we could donate for his church member. I said, brother, we got a wheelchair, we sure do. Matter of fact, it's got a motor on it. <laughs> you do? Yes, sir. This is a God thing, brother. So, and we had some other stuff that he did. Anyway, he come on, got it. Anyway, short story, just to show how God works. Anyway, all right, good. Thank you, Mike. You got me on a rabbit chase with that. Any other comments, questions?
about what we've talked about tonight in the area of fasting. No? All right. Well, in that case then, I'm going to say a short prayer. We're all going to say amen, and we're going to go home, or be dismissed at least, okay? Let's pray together. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of another day and for the life that it brought to us. We thank you, God, that you allow us to serve your kingdom here on earth. God, I ask you tonight to help me to keep my focus on your kingdom and show me the right proper way to show your people how to keep their focus on your kingdom. Protect us, God, from all the insidious stuff on social media. Keep us attuned to your kingdom and to your work. This is our real, real prayer in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for coming.